Exsanguinate is a new spell that was released here in the last patch. It's a physical damage spell with a damage over time component. It also costs life and it is part of the new update to Blood Magic where they split it into two gems and gave us a few spells that cost life to cast. Now initially when I saw this spell, I wasn't too impressed. I saw most people were doing like a spell slinger variant that used corrupting blood and tried to just get as many stacks as they possibly could over time, but that just didn't seem too interesting to me. So I kind of put the idea on the shelf. There were some ideas of like an aura stack version and things like that floating around that seemed interesting, but thankfully a member of my community, Dave, gave me a message was like, hey, I've got this version of Exsanguinate, why don't you give it a shot? And so I did, and here we are. This version of Exsanguinate scales its damage through gem levels, which makes it significantly easier to get going. So this version of the build was a little cheaper than doing the full low life version that some people might know of. It utilizes mainly cold iron points, plus one to level with our chest piece, as well as a plus one, plus one amulet to achieve level 30 Exsanguinate. This gives us a significant damage boost, and with all of the other modifiers that we get on our gear, we can do quite a bit of damage. Now, while most of my builds are relatively cheap, and the Spellslinger version of this one that I have provided in the Path of Building is relatively cheap, the final self-cast version does require some investment. You do need a plus one, plus one amulet, and you do need a plus one to active skill gems chef's piece, as well as quite a few cluster jewels. Now these cluster jewels in general this league have not been that expensive, but I can't tell what's going to happen for next league or the leagues beyond. So keep in mind that anything that I say in this video price-wise only has to do with the prices right now. If you are sometime off in the distant future, unfortunately I can't control the prices there. So how does the build actually perform? Well, it has absolutely excellent clear. Survival is on a pretty high level. We are good at taking elemental damage, good at taking chaos damage, but kind of mediocre at taking physical damage. We solved this in a couple of ways which we'll talk about more later. This build has excellent recovery through life leech as well as some life regeneration and has a very very solid playstyle once you have stacked enough cast speed. However there are some downsides to this build. We do use petrified blood and because of that we are susceptible to damage taken over time. Now you can remedy this with a couple ways that I'll talk about later but on fights like say the maven where there are a bunch of degen mechanics it can get kind of annoying. Also before you actually get good cast speed the self cast version of this is pretty rough to play but I do explain how to get that fully in this video guide. As for how difficult the build is to play I would probably give this a medium to high rating of difficulty. It does require multiple different in-depth mechanics to scale the damage properly, as well as cluster jewels, specific unique jewels, and relatively good game knowledge to be successful at this build. It also does benefit heavily from crafting knowledge. The better you are at crafting, the easier it is to make this gear. However, I will be making a separate full guide to crafting each piece of gear and obtaining each piece of gear on this build. Look forward to that in a day or two. However, once you do get this build geared, it is relatively simple and straightforward to play. You cast Exsanguinate, you move around, that's about it. When it comes to bossing, this build is probably in the medium to high end of bossing characters. It is quite good on a lot of bosses, however, it does struggle with bosses that do have degen zones if you can't avoid those. Fights like the Maven where they disable your ability to regen also do give us problems. However, most other bosses in the game are quite easy. We were able to kill Cirrus, Uber at Ziri with Maven helping, Uber Elder with Maven helping, the Maven herself, Shaper with Maven helping, Elder with Maven helping, and all of the Maven invitations besides the Feared. Unfortunately, I would have needed to push a little bit more damage or maybe practice the feared fight a little bit more because the top end of the DPS of this build gets to around 8 maybe 9 million and that just simply really isn't enough to take on the feared comfortably. However, we were able to handle tier 16 ultimatums, tier 16 delirium map, simulacrum, and more with ease. So now that you've got a bit of an idea of how this build plays, what it does, what it's good at, what it's bad at, let's actually get into the guide and we'll take a little bit of a closer look. Hey guys, Big Ducks here, and welcome back to the channel. Now normally I'd be like, like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, only 71% of you are, but I do wanna to talk today because a couple people are getting annoyed that I keep doing that in every video. Now what that is is called a call to action, and unfortunately it is something that is almost necessary to grow on YouTube nowadays unless you are very, very lucky, or you happen to be doing something very, very unique and people just love that kind of content. So to be able to make sure that these videos do well, liking them, subscribing to the YouTube channel, commenting down below, all boost the algorithm up and lets YouTube know, hey, this video is pretty good, we should probably push this to more people. So I know some of you don't like it, but just understand that it's something that I do to help myself support the channel, to make it so that I can make more content like this. So thank you to everyone that does like the video, does comment and does subscribe. You do really help me out and I appreciate you greatly. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. All right, boys, so this is the self-cast Exsanguinate Scion. Now, I know I've been talking about this build for quite some time, that I've wanted to play it, I didn't know how I was gonna go about it, but fortunately, we did find a way to do it. Now, this is a self-cast build, as I said before. There are tons of people who are playing, like, 
Spellslinger versions of this and all kinds of other stuff, but I really wanted to play self-cast and I really wanted to do it a little differently. Thanks to Dave, who is just a member of the community, to so make sure that you thank him down in the comments. Now remember, there is a lot to go over in this video, so there are going to be chapters and timestamps down below in the description, and you can jump to any particular part of the video you want if you want to maybe know about something in particular, or you just forgot something, you're coming back to the video to check it out. So I do put those chapters in there so you can find where you're going. Now what is Exsanguinate? So Exsanguinate is an ability that they added in 3.14 Ultimatum that is a physical damage spell does physical damage over time and it shoots out these giant bloody tendrils if you've got certain support gems linked to it it can act quite differently now personally while clearing i do use chain it does make this significantly better and allows you to clear essentially the entire screen at once Whenever you do use Exsanguinate, it, the tendrils like leech out to every single enemy nearby. You've probably seen that in some of the clips earlier. But this ability is a little bit different than most other abilities. And the reason for that is, is that the base cost of the spell is actually life. You'll see that the cost of our spell here is 232 life every single time that we cast this. Now, fortunately, we do leech quite a bit. We do have quite a bit of recovery, so this isn't too big of a deal. But you really can spend a lot of your life on this spell, especially if you're not able to recover. But like a map that gives you no regen or no leeching or things like that are really not doable by this build because you'll just kill yourself on all of the uh, on all of the health very, very quickly. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the gems and skills that we actually use on this build. So the main skill, as I said, is Exsanguinate. This fires out a bunch of tendrils. They chain if you do use chain with it. It is not a projectile and it is not AoE. If you actually look at the gem, it is a spell, chaining, physical, and duration, nothing else. You can't use projectile modifiers, and you can't use AoE modifiers. They don't do anything for this build. It is our main source of damage on both single target and clear. We don't use any other real damaging abilities. It does really excellent clear, as well as has pretty good single target. Beyond that, we do use quite a few supplementary abilities. For movement, we do use flame dash just to get across gaps or to be able to, you know, just quickly get out of the way of a boss attack or something like that. But our main form of movement is going to be Whirling Blades. Now, Whirling Blades does do one extra thing for us because we do have it linked to Fortify. Fortify is going to be a big bonus to defenses on this build and you should attempt to keep Fortify up at pretty much all times. What Fortify does is it actually makes it so that you take 20% less damage taken from hits specifically. So this is going to help us take more physical damage which is a little bit weaker on this build as well as any elemental hits or chaos hits that we do take. Fortify is an excellent defensive layer. It is absolutely really important for the build. Now beyond movement we do have a couple other abilities. We do have Enduring Cry. I mainly use this to just keep up endurance charges as well as an easy heal button maybe on bosses or things like that we do also use steel skin on left click this just gives us a little bit more of a buffer of damage while we're moving around and doing things an extra buffer of damage is always nice and then we do have our arcanist brand arcanist brand is actually using two curses we're using a divergent poachers mark as well as vulnerability now you can see the vulnerability is all the way up to level 28 here and vulnerability is quite good here Gives us a bunch of extra fizz damage taken on enemies, and that's the main reason that we use it. It's just a good damage spell. Poacher's Mark is our second curse. We do have dual curse because of the skill tree here. You notice we have Whispers of Doom. And Poacher's Mark is excellent for this build because it does give us negative 25% to physical damage reduction of enemies, as well as adds physical damage to hits against cursed enemies. Both of these do work for this build, so it is quite good. Now, because it is divergent Poacher's Mark, we get an extra 5% to physical damage reduction reduction, so that's pretty solid. You don't need to use divergent, but you might as well if you're going to use it anyways. And this is also linked with life tap so that we can spend our life to cast this ability since we don't have very much mana. That is it for our main normal abilities. We don't use anything else except a bunch of auras. So going through our auras, we do have war banner. War banner is going to be something that causes nearby enemies to take increased physical damage. It's pretty solid. You can place it if you want to for a quick adrenaline boost, but I typically don't place it very often. The other auras that we do use is we use a vitality aura. This allows us to kind of modify how much of our life that we are reserving, which I'll talk about more in a moment. We do actually use Arctic Armor. Now, Arctic Armor isn't something that I've used in quite a while. Now, I do feel like there is some merit in using Aspect of the Spider instead of Arctic Armor if you'd like to. It is absolutely excellent for damage. However, because we kind of have issues with taking Fizz damage, and we do enough damage as is, um, I think it was Corey, one of my mods, suggested that we try out Arctic Armor. It ended up working pretty well. We could always swap over to Aspect of the Spider if we really wanted to. Wouldn't be too big of a deal. You can do either or. And then for the rest of our auras, we use Pride as well as Herald of Purity. These just give us a bunch of extra fizz damage and on top of that we do use a special herald of purity the herald of purity that we use is
is Anomalous Herald of Purity. This is actually pretty excellent because it says minions have a 10% chance to taunt on hit. So when you spawn three or four of these, you get a bunch of just little sentinels that run around and taunt things. Now this can taunt like map bosses and all kinds of stuff, which is really, really useful. A lot of the time, these just tank everything for me and I don't have to worry too much about it. An excellent defensive layer. A lot of people don't use Anomalous Herald of Purity and you really should. The build already uses it. You might as well grab Anomalous. Really good. And then we have our last aura, which is going to be Petrified Blood. You might have noticed that we're low life right now. Now, I know a lot of people have been kind of confused about how Petrified Blood works, but it's not too difficult if you just think of it this way. Essentially, when you are using Petrified Blood, you are simply trading about 10% of your effective life pool for the ability to be on low life. Now, what does low life get us? The main thing that it's going to get us is this pain entombment node, which is 30% more spell damage when on low life. It's like another link to our gem, and it's just pretty solid damage. That is the main benefit of being low life. However, there is one additional benefit. So with the way that leech works, if you know about Slayer over leech, it basically makes it so that you can essentially never stop leeching. There is something similar that works with petrified blood. Now, as long as you are not reserving over, say, like 50%, like it's basically like 50.1% of your health, as long as there's a little itty bitty buffer on your health bar, as long as you have petrified blood on and you're not using a life flask of any kind, you can be essentially over leeching. Now, you might be asking, Big Ducks, how are you going to leech with a fizz spell gem to your life pool? Well, there are a couple ways to do that. The main one that we're using is going to be a delve mod, which is, as you can see here, 0.4% of physical damage leeches life. And then there is also an implicit on synthesized rings, which gives you 0.2 of physical damage leeches life. Now, beyond this, there is the Doriani's belt that drops off of um, Etziri. There's a node that you can get with Glorious Vanity, I'm pretty sure, as well as an amulet mod. But these are probably the easiest ways to go about it. This is mostly required, however, and it is one of the barriers to entry when it comes to playing this build on, say, Solo Cell Found or something like that. You really do need this leech mod at least somewhere to be able to play the build adequately. But because we do only reserve about 49% of our life, maybe a little bit more than that, we essentially get Slayer over Leech. We are constantly leeching and it just kicks in right when we need it, which is an excellent defensive layer. That is most of what you need to know about Petrified Blood. I did talk more about Petrified Blood in the Path of Building. We'll go over some of the stuff that's in the Path of Building later. So if you're interested in that, jump to that part of the video. And that is going to be pretty much it for our skills. It is relatively straightforward to play this build. You use Exsanguinate to kill enemies. You run around. If you need some defensives, you can hit Enduring Cry. And then you just move around and get Fortify stacks and jump around here. For big enemies, you're going to pop down your Arcanist brand and they're going to do the double curse for you. That's pretty much it. Now, a lot of people have been scaling the damage on this build with like things like Corrupting Blood, among other things like Spell Slinger and all of that. But unfortunately, that really just doesn't do very much damage. With the way that Exsanguinate works, you can get a maximum of three stacks at any given time. So I thought to myself, well, if I go self cast and I just focus on doing more damage and getting barely at three stacks on single target, it'd probably do quite a bit more damage, right? And that is how this build works. So we do scale our damage in two main ways. The first way is going to be plus the level of skill gems. Now, ideally, you want to get the skill gem Exsanguinate to level 30. It can go above that, but 30 is the point where you're really going to get the most bang for your buck. How do we do that? First, we are going to need a level 21 gem. So keep in mind, I have all three versions of Exsanguinate here, level 21. We've got Exsanguinate, Divergent, and Anomalous. Now, out of all of them, I feel that Anomalous is best because it does give you some cast speed. We'll talk more about why cast speed is important in a little bit. But there is Divergent, which gives you a little bit better clear. It's honestly not too great and then there's the standard one which gives you increased skill effect duration increased skill effect duration is actually quite good for this build so i do want to mention that if you only have a level 21 normal exsanguinate versus like a level 20 anomalous still use the level 21 gem at all times it's always going to be better so the idea is, is we get level 21 from just the gem corruption. We get plus one from our chest piece. We do get plus three from each of our cold iron points. And then we get plus two from our amulet. Now you could go further beyond this and get a corrupted chest piece that gives you like plus two to duration and like plus one to spells and get like a lot more damage out of that. Not needed whatsoever. It'd be a really good corrupt, but you know, we, we all know how expensive those kinds of chest pieces are. And that is going to allow us to land at a level 30 gem. A level 30 gem is going to give us a significant base to scale all our damage off of. The second way that we're going to be scaling our damage is going to be damage over time multiplier, and we get this in a couple different ways. The main way that we're going to get damage over time multiplier is really going to be from our skill tree as well as cluster jewels. This is not a build that you can skip cluster jewels on. Any physical damage over time build is heavily going to benefit from cluster jewels. 
talk about how to craft all of these in the path of building, as well as there is going to be a full video guide on how to craft all the pieces of gear on this. Look for that soon. It's going to be linked up in the top right corner now if it's already up. If I haven't linked it up there and the video is live, come yell at me on my Discord channel because, you know, I probably forgot. But those are the main two ways that you're going to be scaling your damage. Now, beyond that, we do have like nearby enemies take increased physical damage. We have overwhelm, spell damage, damage multiplier. But those are going to be the main ways. The level of the gem itself as well as damage over time multiplier. Beyond that, there are a few other small things. Like we do have the consecrated ground effect implies 10% increased damage taken. We don't make much use of bottom faith beyond that honestly it's not as crazy as it might seem for this build crit is okay not amazing though we do use cinder swallow urn you could swap this out with literally anything else you want i just like the recover life and energy shield for ultimatums is pretty solid we can't actually do fire damage because we're using cold iron points so you can't make use of the 10 percent extra damage taken so that's not something that you can do and then we do have some block which we'll talk more about later so rumi's is a really solid defensive layer but now that we've talked about how we actually scale our damage let's talk about how we scale our defensives because there's a couple different ways that we do this and when it comes to scaling defenses there's a couple different things that you need to be taking into account you need to be taking into account can you recover your life how big of a hit can you take and how much physical damage chaos damage and elemental damage can you take now when it comes to recovery this build has a ton of it we do leech quite a bit through our rings as well as any other sources of leech that we do get we have a recovery through consecrated ground as well as some other items things like enduring cry steel skin we do get just a generic lot of recovery like life regen on our gear and such so we don't really have too many problems recovering life there are things like energy shield leech there's just the standard recharge of energy shield among other things however when it comes to actually taking damage when it comes to elemental damage those can be covered just by your resistances as long as you have a good life total and your elemental resistances are maxed you won't have problems taking elemental damage you'll be perfectly fine when it comes to chaos damage just max your chaos resist as much as you can i do have mine at 30 right now however it's not too hard to get up to like 60 or 70 very easily easily. If you do that, you're not going to have very many problems with chaos damage taken. However, physical damage is always something that's a little difficult to, to scale defenses for. Typically, the way that most people cover this is going to be block or dodge. Armor is not very good for this kind of thing. A lot of people also scale fortify. So what this build does is this build uses a large just physical life pool of life as well as energy shield. Petrified blood does help us take less damage overall. So I know that you're only seeing 2600 life here. However, it is substantially more than that. We don't take roughly half of the damage because of petrified blood and we recover everything anyways so our life pool is like 180 percent of what you see here it's not actually 5273 it's probably like roughly 5000 life the 5000 life 2000 energy shield is pretty solid and then we do have fortify as i said before as well as our arctic armor arctic armor is going to prevent us from taking more physical damage from hits while we are stationary most of the time when you're taking a big physical hit it's because you're standing still and casting so as long as you're stationary arctic armor will make you take a lot less damage beyond that we do need to keep our flasks up just so that we're moving around regening properly we do have our block from our roomies as well as the armor that it grants steel skin will give us a little bit of a extra defensive layer as well and with all of that combined we should be able to survive most of the time However, there is one thing that this build is quite weak towards, and that's going to be any build that uses petrified blood and goes low life, and that is degen effects. Because of the way that degen effects work, it kind of just skips the defensive layer of petrified blood completely, because petrified blood, if you notice, this says when taking damage from hits, 40% of life lost below half-life is prevented. So, hits don't count for damage over time, meaning things like degen zones or anything that does damage over time to you like debuffs and such will absolutely wreck you and most of the time this isn't an issue however you'll notice things like the maven fight um cirrus degen shaper little ground orbs and things like that will all really annihilate your health bar bleeds are really bad poisons can be bad if you don't have chaos or this this is just a downside of petrified blood it is the main downside of it in my opinion on fights that have lots of degens you can counter this by simply turning off petrified blood and moving your auras over into your mana petrified blood reserves 26 percent of your mana so you can simply move your herald of purity over to your mana pool and then just either turn your vitality off or leave it on. It's only a couple hundred life that it's taking anyways. That is a very easy way to just 
deal with those, you're gonna lose some damage, but in the end, if you're getting one shot anyways, you probably wanna stay alive. Now, talking about the items that this build uses, I do wanna reiterate, I am gonna be making a full crafting guide on how to make all of this gear, so don't worry too much about that. The notes on how to craft it are already in the path of building that's down in the description, so you can go check that out, or you can watch the video if it's live. We do use cold iron points. You can get these just through a random world drop. There's a couple divination cards that get them for you. These are pretty popular early on in the league, but they go down significantly in price as the league goes on. Most of the time, this is a one chaos unique. Now, interestingly, spell damage does work quite well for this build because of the way that it scales damage. It's not a pure damage over time ability. It has both portions. So spell damage actually is the best corruption that you can get for this. And the spell damage corruption is actually pretty cheap, at least right now. The damage over time one is pretty expensive because most fizz spells do damage over time. And you'd think, hey, well, this build does damage over time mostly, but spell damage ends up being better. And beyond that, we do have the helmet here. This helmet is just going to be a crafted helmet. We're looking for nearby enemies to take increased fizz damage. It is one of the better modifiers that we can get and life. Any resists are just a bonus. We crafted this ourselves. It's just a elder helmet. I think we used jagged and pristine fossils to land this. It wasn't too big of a deal. For the chest piece, this is going to be a warlord chest piece that has the plus one to level of socketed active skill gems. This is one of the ways that we get up to level 30 of our base skill. The way that you craft this is going to be relatively simple. It's honestly not too bad. You get the six link base of whatever choice you want. You have to make sure that it's warlords. And then you're going to use metallic and pristine fossils to be able to do this. Once again, I have the other video that I'll cover all of this in. You do want to make sure that you get the gain percentage of maximum life is extra maximum energy shield. Very powerful for this build. Get the plus one, get some life, and whatever other resist you can get on it. When it comes to our gloves, we are mainly looking for physical damage over time multiplier as well as cast speed. These should be pretty easy to grab. Just get the best gloves that you can with physical damage over time multiplier on them. More info on the more expensive gloves in the path of building. For the belt, we really do want to scale as much life as we can. You could get a Stygian belt. However, there's not a ton of Abyssal Jewel mods that are great for this build, so you can just go with a leather belt and then use the 20% quality enchant on it to get quite a bit of life out of this. For the boots, we're really just looking for resistances, life, and move speed. This is a pretty simple slot. However, if you do want to go even above and beyond what this build is capable of, you can use elemental ailment avoidance on your boots. You can get up to 50% if you get an elevated modifier. With some other enchants, you can get 100% avoidance, which is pretty solid, so that's kind of cool. When it comes to the amulet, the plus one, plus one amulet is going to be a really, really big deal for doing damage on this build. It does require an awakener's orb, and it requires two separate items so keep in mind it might be a little expensive to get the full version of this amulet you can make do with just a single plus one amulet but that level 30 gym is really ideal when it comes to rings there are two separate kinds of rings that you can get and you really do need to focus on this the percentage of physical damage leached as life is very important here it can't be physical damage uh, attacks leached as life or anything else there's only a couple sources of this this one drops in delve i think it's from the physical nodes in delve and there also is the synthesized base the synthesized base is probably going to be cheaper to get most of the time to get it because you just need the base and then you can roll it yourself. However, farming either of these is pretty rough. You probably have an easier time farming the Delve one than you would farming the Synthesize base. When it comes to flask, we just use a Quicksilver flask, a Quartz flask so that we have the ability to phase through enemies, dodge is kind of whatever. I use a Rumi's because this build does have some block. We'll talk about that more when we actually go to the part about the Ascendancy. And then we do use Cinder Swallow as well as Bottled Faith. Now, as I said, Bottled Faith is not super important for this build. You could simply use a Sulfur flask of any kind. You could use a Basalt flask if you wanted to. There's a ton of other options that you could use here. However, the Consecrated Ground is really nice just for regen as well as the extra damage taken, and I've got one, so I decided that I would use it. Same thing with the Cinder Swallow Urn here. You could just swap this out for a simple, normal Silver Flask with something else on it. Would be perfectly fine. Also, the Crit Strike Chance probably isn't needed. The Move Speed and like Stun Avoidance would almost be better in this case, honestly. And that's going to be pretty much it for Flask. Now, I do want to talk about Jewels and Cluster Jewels because they are very important to this build. It is non-negotiable that you use Cluster Jewels. So if you are intimidated by Cluster Jewels, this is not the build to play for you because we do use two full sets of them. First Jewel I want to talk about is going to be the Thread of Hope. This is a large Thread of Hope. It is a large ring one. We do get quite a few good things out of this. This is going to be some reservation of skills, which is something that we need. We do grab some life here. You can also grab these other two little life nodes if you need more life. And then we can grab this Vanquisher node here, as well as this Fizz Dot Multiplier here. You can grab this Life node too, which is pretty solid, but that's about it that you get from here. This saves you a couple points, which is pretty good. We do use a Corrupt Blood Immunity Jewel. If you don't want to use as many of the unique flasks, you can just get Corrupting Blood and Bleed Immunity on a flask. You don't need this, however, it is very good. 
As I said before, degens are very, very dangerous to this build, so being immune to Corrupted Blood is really, really nice. Now, we do also use a Glorious Vanity in the name of Doriani. This is pretty important because it's the main source of energy shield for the build. It gets us Corrupted Soul, gain 15% of maximum life as extra maximum energy shield. Very, very good. You can get some pretty interesting corruptions here, like you can get Fizz Damage, Life. You can get something that gives you physical damage leached as life, which is actually pretty good, but it is kind of rare, so this could be an optimization that you could do if you didn't want to have to use these rings or you wanted to get like a curse on hit ring instead of using poacher's mark here something like that and that's the idea you could go for that it's a very very high-end option that i don't necessarily think that you should go for but the option is there now beyond that we do use quite a few clusters we use two large physical damage clusters you're going to see both of them here we use three fizz damage over time medium clusters as well as a curse cluster and then we also do use a chaos resist cluster now for the large physical clusters, you are going to want to focus on Furious Assault. Ass speed is at a premium in this build and you need as much of it as you can possibly get. If you don't have every source of cast speed imaginable, I'm talking like Furious Assault, as many of those as you can get, cast speed on the tree, um, quality awakened control destruction, anomalous exsanguinate, having onslaught here. I mean, you really want absolutely everything that you can possibly get for the build to feel good. You don't need all of it for it to feel good but the more that you get the better to be honest with you beyond this you do want to try to get master the fundamentals elemental resistances can be kind of a struggle on this build when you're crafting all of your own gear it's a little hard to get all of the elemental resistances you need and then the last slot can be whatever exploit weakness is okay there is also going to be battle hardened among other things you just want damage for the medium clusters when it comes to these physical damage over time clusters the main thing that you're really looking for is going to be brush with death this is going to be damage over time multiplier as well as recover life and energy shield which is both really really solid for recovery on this build and then the other thing that you're looking for is you're looking to get blood artists now ideally you would want all three cluster jewels to have both of those nodes it's pretty rough because they're kind of rare to get all together so just go for as many brush with deaths as you can as many blood artists as you can and then anything else that gives you physical damage over time multiplier keep in mind phlebotomist is a little bit rough to keep going you do need to crit recently which is in the last four seconds so as long as you have a decent crit chance like my crit chance with this spell if I have the flask up is like 10% I think like maybe 10 11% with the flask up if you're hard casting that you'll probably have crit recently so it's okay but it's not ideal just because you know you're not going to crit all the time and then we do also have a curse cluster here the curse cluster is mainly going to be looking for evil eye which is enemies take more damage and you blind enemies the first time that you curse them and then you can also get cull here which is pretty good but I haven't invested in it on my personal character exploit weakness is pretty good the last one that we're going to talk about is going to be this chaos resistance jewel here you don't need any venom i would actually suggest that you get one without any passive skill on it and you just go for as much chaos resist as much life and as much dexterity as you can get those are the main things you're looking for anti-venom is good just because it gives you a bunch of base chaos resist but you can do better that's the main thing you're going to be looking for here is just as many stats as you can on this and that's going to be it for most of the gear now you can start this build as a spell slinger variant. I have talked about that extensively in the path of building. When you are leveling the build, you will initially start as a bow character. You use split arrow as well as puncture. When we initially go out through the tree, we'll be coming out here, grabbing a bunch of resist and some fizz damage and fizz damage over time, as well as these notes here. So it will be pretty easy to actually level with split arrow and puncture. Once you get to the point where you can use spell slinger, you should be able to use a four link exsanguinate as well as a four link reap. When you do level up a bit more, you can get like a five link or a six link exsanguinate. These should carry you through most of the game all the way up into yellow or red maps and allow you to farm the currency to be able to make the transition. Now, I do want to jump over into the path of building here because talking about all of this is going to be way more difficult than just showing you. I've spent a ton of time on this path of building. I've completely revamped almost everything about the way that I do these path of buildings. So let's go ahead and jump over into there now. All right, boys. So now that we're here in the path of building, there is a ton to go over. There are going to be multiple skill trees that should give you every single little piece of information that you need. We've got an early leveling tree, spell slinger leveling trees. We've got all of the steps to actually do the self cast transition as well as a high investment final tree here. The skills section, you'll see all of the skills that you need and everything that you should grab. Make sure to take a look at this. There's tons of information in here. It's got the skills that you need for the spell slinger version as well as the end game version. It has multiple item sets, some spell slinger starter items, the minimum gear that you're gonna require for self cast as well as the gear that I use in this video and some more expensive high-end gear that you can get here as well. 
And then in the notes, I have pretty much completely redone these notes. There's so much information in here. There is going to be a bunch of information about how I've rated the build, how the configuration is set up, a bunch of frequently asked questions talking about most of the stuff I go over in this video guide. There's going to be information on leveling, how you should gear, some tips to level with each different type of leveling, like the bow base leveling. There's going to be leveling about the spell slinger. There's making the transition to self cast, all of the step by step instructions that you need to do the full transition. It's, it's a little rough. Some general playstyle information, cluster jewel information which clusters you should get talking about the ascendancy crafting the gear there's crafting notes on every single piece of gear that you can craft there's a bunch of stuff however I do want to go over the ascendancy points leveling and what you're going to be doing early on so let's go through that when you initially start this build you will be a bow character split arrow puncture is mainly what you're going to be using there are not a lot of good points for us early on so we are going to have to just take what we can get Early on, I would say go out through the fizz damage, get some life, and head up to these nodes here, Veteran, Soldier, and Relentless, and then you can fill in these resist nodes as you need them. This will be most of what we need for leveling up as Split Arrow and Puncture, and then after we actually transition into our Spell Slinger variant, we're going to be moving over to the left here, grabbing some Int because we're going to need it, maybe even some Dexterity too, and these Fizz Damage and Fizz Damage over Time Nodes. On the next level that we're going to be going for, we're going to be moving over to the right side of the tree. This is going to get us some Spell Damage, it's going to get us some Life and some Life on Kill, and our first little bit of Reservation of Skills Reduction. This is going to be really important as you level up, you do need to make sure that you get these nodes or you're not going to be able to sustain the spell slinger into mana that you need to be able to get like a four link or a five link. And then we head up here, get some attack and cast speed and some damage over time. On the next step of this, we're going to be moving up here to the left to once again get some more life as well as some more mana reduction of our skills. We're going to need this once again to be able to continue to get all the links that we need as well as some life. At this point in the next transition, this is going to be when we do our skill point quest. So at the end of the campaign, I suggest you go back, do all the skill point quests that you can get, get this fizz damage here. We move up towards the top here, get some damage over time, some life and some generic stats. At this point, you'll be moving towards the end game and in the end game, you can move up here, get some more block nodes up at the top, grab these fizz nodes, and then also start grabbing some block nodes here so that you can fill out your defenses for the early section of the end game, talking about like white maps and yellow maps. At this point, you should be preparing to transition into self-cast. Around this point, you're going to want to gather up some currency, get all of the items in the initial like self-cast minimum gear level, and then you're gonna wanna follow these steps. So I've got full steps here of transition. So the first one is gonna be removing all of the points that you need, as well as going into the Thread of Hope, filling in the Thread of Hope here. We've got a one cluster setup, which only uses a single set of cluster jewels, will be a little bit cheaper. And then we do have the full cluster jewel setup, which uses two sets of cluster jewels here. And then you can move into the self-cast version, which is what you saw in the actual build video. And when it comes to your actual ascendancy, when you're originally starting out, ascendancies for the ascendant can be a little bit rough. We personally use the gladiator as well as the trickster ascendancies. These are going to give us some stats that we need as well as allow us to move over to the right side of the tree. So early on, your first two points are going to be just this strength and dexterity node as well as a passive point. On the next level that you're going to get, which we have to go a little bit further here, we're going to grab the gladiator ascendancy. This is gonna give us block and spell block as well as a chance to blind enemies on hit with attack. This is only really gonna be useful to us while we're the spell slinger version, and then we're gonna get more physical damage over time. This is gonna be very, very powerful for the build, so keep that in mind. We also do grab this stat node here. As we continue to level up, we will grab the trickster ascendancy. This is going to give us frenzy and power charges on kill, which is pretty nice for clearing, as well as increased recovery rate of life, mana, and energy shield if you've killed an enemy affected by your damage over time recently. We use reap, we use exsanguinate while leveling, we're gonna have this up pretty much all the time. And then it also does help us prevent some stuns that can happen to us as well. The chance to gain 50% of non-chaos damage with hits as extra chaos damage does help while leveling, but because we are not going to be able to deal anything but physical damage later, this won't do anything for us. As we continue on, we will get the Path of the Shadow. This is gonna be important for later when you do the transition steps because we are going to drop all of these points here to be able to fill in these points here. So make sure that you look at all of that. That is gonna be most most of what you need to know for leveling, I have more notes in here talking about leveling and such and the things that you should do. As I've reiterated like a hundred times now, the path of building, this is going to be the new way that I do path of building. It's going to have a ton of notes, all the information that you could ever need. So make sure that you check it out here. Now, as I said before, when it comes to the item sets, you're initially going to be starting with Spell Slinger. Try to get the gear that's in here. Make sure that you match the tree to it here. So you're not going to want to go above like the Spell Slinger tree because you're going to see a bunch of like crazy jewels and things like that that you're not going to know. You're not going to have them. So you don't want to do that. 
I will say that the Spellslinger starter is pretty solid. It should be able to make it into like white and yellow maps pretty easily. This is the minimum gear that you're going to need for self cast. Make sure that you do look at the initial uh, like self cast tree. Go to this step four here and then look at the items here. Make sure that you have all of this ready before you do the actual self cast. As I said in the notes, I do have full step by step guides on how to do that in the portion here that says making the transition to self cast. There is my gear. This is the gear that you saw in the actual video. And then the expensive gear that has all of the expensive crafted gear that you'll find in that other video as well as in the notes. And that is pretty much going to be all that you need to know about the build. And that is going to be it for the video. Now, if you have any further questions beyond what I've answered here or in the path of building, make sure that you check out my Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash big notes, which you should follow, by the way. I might be able to answer your question there. And if I'm not able to, then you can join my Discord. Both are linked down in the description. I have a ton of helpful community members, and I'd love for you to become a part of the community as well. So this build did really well. Um, I'm glad that we finally found an Exsanguinate build that actually, you know, it was up to my liking. I, I didn't really like all the Spellslinger versions and anything like that, so I'm glad that we did finally find one. But remember, boys, if you enjoy this content, make sure that you like this video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel for more content similar to this, and stay safe out there in Rain Clouds. And I'll see you guys in the next video.